segment is the community moment. Uh, community moment is an opportunity for one of our members to come up and tell about themselves or uh, give them something personal about their journey. Uh, today, I'm excited to announce that our own Josh Laws will be giving a community moment. Uh, he introduced me uh, when I gave my community moment, so now I get to return the favor and introduce him. Uh, a uh, tradition started by uh, our, uh, our friend Brian Carino was to uh, say, give three words about the speaker that described him. Uh, the three words that Josh gave me were uh, procrastinate, passionate, and hibernate. So I can certainly appreciate all three of those words. His morning label would be caution full of surprises. <laughs> so uh, anyway, can we please get a warm welcome for our friend Josh Laws. Thank you. Oh. I feel pretty. <laughs> oh, so pretty. All right. All right, guys. So um, a few months ago, I stumbled upon an essay by Isaac Asimov titled The Relativity of Wrong, which kind of inspired me to put together this community moment. Asimov has always been a hero of mine. Uh, you probably know him as a science fiction author, but he was also a professor of biochemistry at Boston University. He was a scientific historian, and he was also the president of the American Humanist Association from 1985 until his death in 1992. It's not too far of a stretch, I think, to suggest that he would be at home with us here if he was still alive today. Um, the essay I discovered is actually an introduction to a book of the same title, in which Asimov tries to counter uh, the argument that all scientific theories are proven wrong in time. Um, the essay begins with an English lit major who pins a letter to Asimov, chastising him for his arrogance and asserting that we're fairly lucky to live in a century where we've kind of figured out all of the basic rules governing the universe. I mean, you see, Asimov in one of his essays had kind of contended that with the theory of relativity worked out between 1905 and 1916, explaining the gravitational interrelationships of the universe's components, quantum theory explaining the basic rules governing subatomic particles and their interrelationships, discovered between 1900 and 1930, and the discovery of galaxies and clusters of galaxies as the basic units of the physical universe, discovered between 1920 and 1930, that we now have kind of a pretty clear picture of exactly how the universe is put together. And then he further noted that each and every one of these are 20th century discoveries, which is pretty amazing. Now, the English lit student was not very impressed. He argued that in every century, people thought they finally understood the universe at last. And in every century, they were proven to be wrong. And so it follows that the one thing that we can say about our modern knowledge is that it's also wrong. The young student then quoted the philosopher Socrates, who had famously said, if I am the wisest man, it is because I alone know that I know nothing. Implying, essentially, that to claim knowledge itself was a fool's errand and an act of arrogance. Now, Asimov's answer to the young man was this, John. When people thought that the Earth was flat, they were wrong. When they thought the Earth was spherical, they were also wrong. But if you think that thinking that the Earth is spherical is just as wrong as thinking that the Earth is flat, your view is wronger than both of those. <laughs> you see, the basic trouble is that people tend to think of right and wrong as absolutes, that everything is it, that isn't perfectly and completely right is totally and equally wrong. For example, how do you spell sugar? Well, it's S-U-G-A-R, and anything else is wrong. Or what's two plus two? The answer is four, and everything else. But if I ask two students to spell sugar, and Wendy says P-F-Z-Z-H, but Lucy says S-H-U-G-E-R, it's fair to say that Wendy is more wrong than Lucy. Or if I ask someone to spell sugar and they spell S-U-C-R-O-S-E, sucrose, or they say C-12-H-22-O-11, well, technically both answers are wrong, but they show an understanding of the subject that goes well beyond basic spelling. Now, the same question, what is 2 plus 2? If you answer 2 plus 2 equals an integer, well, you're right, aren't you? And if you say 2 plus 2 equals an even integer, well, you're even righter. And if you say 2 plus 2 equals 3.999999999, well, you're very nearly right. And if the answer is 4, but we don't distinguish between the various wrongs, doesn't that kind of set an unnecessary limit to our understanding? So when someone like this English literature expert tells you that scientists in every century who claim to understand the universe are wrong, what Asimov suggests that you do is ask yourself, well, how wrong were they? Let's look at another example. 
In the early days of civilization, the general feeling was that the earth was flat. And this isn't because people were stupid or because they were intent on believing silly things. They felt that the earth was flat based on sound evidence. Now what we're really discussing when we talk about the flatness of earth is curvature. Over a considerable length, how much does the surface deviate on the average from perfect flatness? Now the flat earth theory would make it seem that the surface doesn't deviate from flatness at all, that the curvature is zero to the mile. Well, nowadays, of course, we're taught that the flat earth theory is wrong. It's terribly wrong, absolutely wrong. But it really isn't. The curvature of the Earth is very nearly zero per mile, so that although the flat Earth theory is wrong, it happens to be nearly right. And that's why the theory lasted so long. See, there were reasons to be sure that the flat Earth theory unsatisfactory. And in 350 BC, Aristotle summarized them. First, certain stars disappeared depending on what hemisphere you were located in. Second, the Earth's shadow on the moon during a lunar eclipse was always the arc of a circle. And third, ships disappeared beyond the horizon. All three observations could not reasonably be, reasonably be explained if the Earth's surface was flat, but could be explained by assuming the Earth to be a sphere. Then about a century after Aristotle, another Greek philosopher noted that the sun cast shadows of different lengths at different latitudes. From the difference in the shadow lengths, he calculated the size of the earthly sphere to be roughly 25,000 miles in circumference. The curvature of such a sphere is 0.000126 per mile, a quantity very close to zero per mile. Now the tiny difference between zero and 0 0.000126 accounts for the fact that it took so long to move from the flat earth theory to the spherical earth theory. But yet, is the Earth really a sphere? No, it's not a sphere in the strict mathematical sense. You see, Isaac Newton, towards the end of the 17th century, showed that a massive body would form a sphere under the pull of gravitational forces, but only if it weren't rotating. If it rotated, a centrifugal effect would be set up which would lift the body's substance against gravity, and the effect would be greater closer to the equator. The effect would also be greater the more rapidly a spherical object rotated. Actual measurements of the curvature of the Earth were carried out in the 18th century, and Newton was proved correct. The Earth has an equatorial bulge. In other words, it's fatter in the middle and flattened at the poles. It is an oblate spheroid rather than a sphere. To put it another way, on a flat surface, curvature is zero per mile everywhere. On Earth's spherical surface, curvature is 0 0.000126 per mile everywhere, or eight inches per mile. But on Earth's oblate spheroidal surface, the curvature varies from 7.9 inches to the mile to 8.02 inches to the mile, a difference of less than a tenth of an inch. So the correction in going from spherical to oblate spheroidal is much smaller than from going to flat to spherical. Therefore, although the notion of the Earth as a sphere is wrong, strictly speaking, it is not as wrong as the notion of the Earth being flat. So, but according to our English literature friends' absolute interpretations of right and wrong, the Earth could be thought to be spherical now, but a cube next century, a hollow isohedron the next. But what actually happens is that once scientists get a hold of a good concept, they gradually refine and extend it with greater and greater subtlety as their instruments of measurement improve. Theories are not so much wrong as just incomplete. Since the refinement in the theory grows smaller and smaller, even quite ancient theories must have been sufficiently right to allow advances to be made, advances not wiped out by subsequent refinements. So the Greeks introduced the notion of latitude and longitude, for instance, and made pretty reasonable maps of the Mediterranean basin without ever taking sphericity into account, and we still use latitude and longitude today. The Sumerians were probably the first to recognize that planetary movements in the sky exhibit regularity and can be predicted, and they proceeded to work out ways of doing so, even though they assumed the Earth to be the center of the universe. Their measurements have been enormously refined, but the principle remains. Newton's theory of gravitation, while incomplete over vast distances and enormous speeds, is perfectly suitable for the solar system, and Halley's Comet appears punctually as his theories predict every 75 or 85 years, whatever it is. Naturally, at some point in the future, the theories we now have must be considered naturally. At some point in the future, the theories we now have might be considered wrong in the simplistic sense. 
but in a much truer and subtler sense, they only need to be considered incomplete. And through still greater refinement, we will discover even more about the universe than we already know. Nature of the Big Bang, creation of the universe, properties at the centers of black holes, subtle points about the evolution of galaxies and supernovas, on and on and on. So my hope is that all of us as skeptics and freethinkers will not fall into the trap of the binary concept of absolute right and wrong. The nature of discovery is much more nuanced and gradual, but I also say don't let cynics get away with suggesting to you that just because we're probably wrong in the strictest sense regarding what we believe now, that we're still not a hell of a lot closer to capital T truth than we've ever been at any other point in our history, which makes these very exciting times to live in. Thank you for sharing some of that time with me. Have a good Sunday. <laughs>